Um, I, I want to welcome you to uh, Berkeley, the Berkeley Institute's Summer Salon Series Session 2. Uh, I'm Professor Ken Bamberger, along with Ron Hasner. We are the co-directors of the Berkeley Institute. And today, we are super excited to have with us two scholars and teachers who are very much part of the Berkeley family and part of the Berkeley Institute family, Professor Sharon aronson Lahavi and Dan Schifrin. And I also want to welcome all of, uh, all of you, uh, part of the Institute family, our funders and supporters, uh, our undergraduate fellows and students, our alums, and of course, those of you new to the Institute as well. Welcome. Uh, before I share uh, a little bit more about Professor Arnsa Mojave and Dan Sheffrin, a few words about the Institute. The Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies houses two core programs, Berkeley's Program in Israel Studies, a nationally recognized initiative for the study of Israel, and the Berkeley Program on Jewish Law, Thought, and Identity, the only one of its type in the Western United States. Our work focuses on deep student, faculty, and community engagement around Israel and around Jewish identity. In service of that, we host the Visiting Israeli Faculty Program, which brings six or seven visiting prominent Israeli teachers to campus every year, as well the Undergraduate Fellows Program. And I'm glad to see a whole bunch of members of our undergraduate student program here with us today. Today, we are glad to host Professor Sharon aronson Lahavi. Sharon served as the Lisa and Douglas Goldman Visiting Israeli Professor at UC Berkeley several years ago. Uh, and is now the head of the theater arts, the chair of the theater arts department at uh, Tel Aviv University. Her research focuses on the relations between ritual and religion and theater, both in the late medieval and modern periods. She got her PhD from the Graduate School uh, of CUNY and uh, has won many awards and grants for her pioneering work. Until a month ago, she also served as the academic director of the University Theater at Tel Aviv University, uh, an extraordinary and innovative theater for those familiar with the Israeli scene. We're also happy to welcome Dan Schifrin. Dan, who uh, many of you know as being part of our community, has taught creative writing at UC Berkeley and San Francisco State. He's been a visiting scholar at Stanford, and served as the writer in residence at the Contemporary Jewish Museum. He's the author, among other things, of the play Sweet and Sour, and a forthcoming memoir about fatherhood and science fiction. A former columnist for both the New York Jewish Week and the J, he's the winner of the 2016 Wilner Award for short fiction. Uh, I'll turn the, the stage over to Dan and Sharon and say thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Hi, Sharon. Hi, hi, everybody. Great being here. Um, so uh, we're gonna jump in formally in just one second. Um, I think that um, I was just gonna say for a little bit of grounding for our conversation, there's gonna be kind of two threads that we're going to be following. Um, one has to do with what it is that theater can teach us and offer us in moments of crisis and transformation. So we'll be looking at theater and the historiography of theater. And we'll also be looking at the Israeli experience in the Israeli scene and looking at ways in which we can maybe understand the Israeli experience um, by looking more deeply into its, its theater and performance. So those are kind of the two things that will be um, the twin strands of the DNA for the identity of this conversation. I could go deeply into that metaphor. Um, but before we do that, Sharon, I just wanted to um, ask you just for a moment about, um, you know, what's happening in Israel, what's happening in your, you know, university department, um, especially in this moment of, of COVID. Can you just say a word, like what's the last few days been like? Sure. So hi, everybody, really um, great being here. Thanks for the invitation, wonderful introduction and conversation. I, I hope we enjoy this um, hour together. 
Um, our department is um, quite like TDPS at Berkeley, a practical um, theater arts department. We have acting and directing classes and we have a university theater and we produce something like eight to 10 full productions every year. So um, the entire world and human lives are, are, are seriously challenged, of course, but I have to say that theater, the discipline, the um, theater discipline is also one of those that is seriously challenged and as a professor of theater, we all moved online to Zoom over the past semester. So teaching the seminars, we had to adjust to that, but definitely it was, uh, I have to say, quite hard for our um, acting and directing teachers and students and all the productions we planned for the semester. Um, as you probably know, in Israel, um, there was a, a, about a two month period of uh, lockdown, something like that, but then um, the situation looked great and um, they opened up everything in, in two weeks, where now the situation here is quite bad right now. But during the past six to eight weeks, many things were um, open, including um, our students were, the practical students um, were able um, to come back to the university and work with all kinds of, you know, social distancing and mask, etc., and work um, on their theater productions. But um, right now, where they're supposed to uh, premiere with them, etc. It seems that things are closing down again and people are once again getting isolated and things. So it's, it's, it's really challenging and definitely, you know, all of us um, are um, thinking of new ways to teach um, theater and to create theater because of these circumstances. And if, if you'll allow me, and of course, um, we, we can continue with the conversation, but I um, just wanted to show you um, one uh, slide before we move on. So this is the uh, premiere of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream in our um, university gallery um, that premiered one day before the lockdown. So this is March 11 and then March 12, everything closed down and um, you know, <laughs> it's a wonderful production. You know, Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, you can see kind of the um, um, the, the, the wood, um, the trees, the cut down trees that symbolize life and death. But um, so the theater hall is still waiting for the production to um, come back, um, hopefully in, in the fall. But this, um, I thought I, so this is how we ended at the um, um, University Theater and Theater Department on March 11. Live theater is like art, you can't always control everything in your environment. And there seems to be uh, a small gardening situation happening outside at just the wrong time. So um, bear with me as we, as we move through that, I apologize. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's interesting to talk about uh, Midsummer's Night Dream, which is one of Shakespeare's comedies uh, where everything turns out all right. And I was just reminded how um, in Shakespeare's time during the plague, uh, he took some time, I believe, to write King Lear. That's what he did during that moment. And there are plenty of examples of writers, uh, not just in theater, think of Montaigne also kind of writing, inventing the essay during the bubonic plague. Um, but writing and writing theater at a time of crisis is different than actually creating theater. Um, and so I'm wondering as we start, if you could maybe um, bring us into a moment in time are some moments in time where uh, we learn what's possible and how theater has adjusted uh, to these kind of moments. Yeah, so if it's okay, I'll um, be using the um, uh, slides, I hope. So this is, you already know, The Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, I thought I'd start um, with a very interesting term, Kunstwende, which is a turning point in the arts, it's uh, in German. Um, and the, um, the artist who coined this uh, term is um, Herwart Walden. He was a, actually a Jewish expressionist um, artist in the 1920s and um, founder of the expressionist uh, journal Der Sturm, The Storm, amidst um, World War I. And um, Lothar Schreier, who was a major other expressionist artist, uh, wrote a whole book on expressionist art where he discussed this term. And Kunstwende, a turning point in the arts, it's derived from Weltwende, a turning point in history. So this is what they kind of felt a century ago during World War I. And here he says, uh, as strange as this may appear to those who misunderstood expressionism then, you know, the avant-garde new movement in arts and, and theater, uh, as well as many avant-garde uh, movements that sprung uh, a century ago. And to those who misunderstand it again today, when he writes this book in uh, 1948, 
it was the human being that concerned us and not art. We perceived the Kunstwende, the changing point in, arts, uh, in the arts, merely as a phenomenon, a visible feature of the Weltwende, which individuals had to realize within themselves. So he writes very nicely, but I think, um, although it's written um, in, in uh, 1948 in retrospective of what happened at, in the early uh, 20th century during uh, World War I, it captures a sense that many artists, uh, definitely theater artists, and many people around the world are, are feeling that it is a turning point in history and a turning uh, point in arts. And you know, just to give you a very, very brief illustration, um, so uh, Lothar Schreier, this, uh, who wrote this text, um, on, on the left you see he um, started to invent all kinds of expressionist um, religious uh, performances. This on the left here is um, um, his designs for costumes, full body masks of the uh, crucifixion, um, embodying the suffering of, um, of the war. So it opens with, um, we won't work on that at all, but Ich leide kreuz kreuz uns, I suffer and uh, cross crucifies us. And he has here an entire new language of movement and sound and um, colors, etc. And on uh, the right, you can see I mentioned um, this Der Sturm, um, the, um, the storm, this uh, avant-garde um, 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 journal that was all about new forms. And one of the members um, I think is interesting in this context is Marc Chagall. So here you see a 1917 drawing of Marc Chagall um, on the front page. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that this group of artists, just like everybody today, were looking for new languages. I think it is fair to say or fair to assume that a, um, a century ago, more or less, um, um, there was already many gradual philosophical, historical, um, political changes going on with which the avant-garde uh, movement sprung. Whereas um, these days, I mean, the pandemic is uh, so sudden, so you know, theater and the pandemic 2020, um, we are suddenly challenged and we suddenly have to rethink our discipline. We suddenly have to rethink what theater means. And I, I would say that, you know, the, the, big, the, the big things for, for theater artists, um, of course, social distancing is almost um, a complete opposite to the idea of um, congregating in the theater. And um, those of you who, who know the words in Hebrew, kahal, which is audience, and kehila, which is congregation, basically come, actually come from the same word. So avoiding uh, or, or practicing social distancing, um, you know, changes a very, very fundamental kind of idea of coming together. I do think that, um, you know, coming together like we are doing right now has something of the liveness and the theatricality of the theater, but not this physical immediate interaction, um, which in, in, in cases of, of Kehilot of congregations is usually more local, whereas now you know it can be much more um, global, international. Um, so, so this would be one one major question. Then, of course, I already kind of mentioned it briefly, but what happens to the liveness of the theatrical event? And many, many theater artists are thinking about that. How to, how to capture that moment where everybody, um, this co-presence of actors and, and performers and and audience members, and of course presence, embodiment, and touch, which are central to the art of theater, definitely as we know it over the past 50 or 60 um, years, you know, modern and, and contemporary um, theater. Um, very, very briefly, or you know, where we're going, you know, theater wasn't always inside closed halls. This is a convention we're used to, but it's not how theater was invented or practiced for basically hundreds of years. So if you think of some of the greatest epos in, in theater, the Greek theater, uh, classical Greek theater, or the Ren or Shakespeare, we mentioned him already today, the Globe Theater or the Shakespearean period theater, theater was outside. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll see um, a lot more of outdoor theater that um, also perhaps interacts with the public sphere um, um, more, um, maybe even, you know, um, um, socially and, and maybe politically. Um, we'll definitely see where are, we are already seeing, I'll show you an image in a moment, um, digital forms of theater. And this is, um, you already mentioned it, um, um, Dan, at the outset, one of the things that I think maybe a bit more metaphorically, but since we have to walk around all the time with masks and cover our faces and the um, um, reality of the pandemic converges with um, the political reality we are experiencing worldwide and questions of identity are so complex, 
So just as I spoke a, a minute uh, ago about, you know, the expressionist or other avant-garde movements and, and World War I, here um, I, I think these questions of um, self and other, embodying the other and wearing masks, it's, it's a good moment not only to you go back to using masks in the theater because we have to keep social distancing, but, and this is something I hope to kind of develop a bit in this uh, conversation today, um, an opportunity to think more deeply about the meaning of, of mask and, and embodying the other. So um, just very briefly as a, to show you a digital um, form of theater, this is uh, New York City, the public theaters, what do we need to talk about, written and directed by Richard Nelson, and I think you can find it on YouTube, and it's um, a Zoom performance about, it's site-specific site -specific Zoom performance about, um, the, about uh, Corona. It's, uh, um, it was live streamed on Zoom. It's a very interesting example. We won't speak about it um, today, but just to let you know that um, theater artists are thinking about what can be um, done. And um, I, I can pause, I mean, if, uh, before we, we move uh, uh, forward, but um, um, here we're looking, uh, I'll say, you know, at the, the oldest, probably the oldest uh, mask, it's a stone mask, 7,000 BC. So people um, have been wearing masks way beyond, um, you know, uh, um, closed theaters <laughs> were built and um, audiences were darkened and, um, um, set, and you know, sitting together in proxemics that um, <laughs> we cannot practice these days. So, um, yeah. Sharon, there's, there's so many um, delightful tidbits um, to kind of dig into. And, um, you know, one thought is for me, maybe just to surface a few things as we're talking and, you know, possibly to respond to one, but also just for people to think about as we move into kind of the conversation per se um, a little bit later. Um, right. One is just that, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day that one thing, one thing that we miss about going to synagogue, about going to shul, is that we miss the theatricality of it. We miss the performative aspect of being in synagogue. And by that, I don't mean like a cantor or a rabbi orating or, you know, laning performatively, but about the whole sense of a community, the choreography of it, and we feel it in our bones in a way, and that kind of, we miss something about that. So that, Kahal Kahila and the idea of congregating and congregation is really powerful. I hadn't thought of that obvious connection. Um, and I also just been thinking about masks, uh, and you're probably, I don't know exactly how you're gonna work with that, but just the idea of wearing masks or not wearing masks is a kind of a political theater right now uh, mm -hmm. that divides people into you know, different kinds of audiences. Um, and the idea that we are, the audience is wearing a mask as well as the actors is, is fascinating. So um, yeah, let's, um, let's keep going yeah. last and, and see if you want to work any of that into our next module. Yeah, I think it's a, a great comment. I think what happened in the field of theater studies over the past, I would say 30 years is the rise of what we call performance studies and the idea, um, and of course, performance studies is a much wider field as well, but the idea that of course, actors on stage wear masks and costumes and enact different characters, but also in everyday life, um, you know, there is this performativity of the self and, um, um, and, and the questions of appearance, uh, voice, color, um, accent, and I'll address all of those. And the theater is a forum, is a cultural forum in whatever uh, shape or place or, or way it takes place that enables um, a deep and thoughtful exploration because of this um, basic theatrical um, idea that I play someone else to explore these relations between self and other. And this is um, something I would like to address in uh, three interrelated uh, um, examples, but I'll, I'll pause after the first one so we can, you know, um, um, talk and then um, move on. Great, so I'll okay. chat. Okay, so um, we already know this slide. Um, I'm starting uh, with a very, very interesting uh, production. It's uh, from 1928. Um, it's Jacob and Rachel, Yaakov and Rachel, at the Ohel Theater in Tel Aviv. Um, and it was adapted into Hebrew uh, by uh, Avraham uh, Shlonsky, maybe you know the name, uh, from Nikolai uh, Karshnenikov's um, play, which is called Cry of Rachel. So it's not a direct adaptation of the biblical story, although uh, Karshnenikov's play is. Um, but he took this uh, story, but it's basically the same story, translated it into Hebrew. This play was written in 1910. And um, Moshe Halevi, 
who is the founder, will speak in a moment about what the Ohel Theater, the tent theater means. Here, if you can see in the image, is sitting in the center. I hope you see my mouse cursor. He's sitting in the front row in the center. Um, and the entire group of actors, um, the, they used to do these stage plays of the group, sits around him. And um, you can see, I'll, I'll put it kind of bluntly, how they um, were costumed, how they played um, uh, the, the biblical characters of uh, Rachel, uh, Yaakov, Rachel, Lavan, Leah. Um, this is how it looked, you know, in the Bible. Um, on the right hand, you see the poster of the, um, it's in Hebrew, Yaakov and Rachel, Teatron Oil, on Tuesday, 19, uh, um, um, 14 February uh, 1928. Um, it's important that you take a look at this uh, picture, how the group looks uh, The group looks on stage, because this is um, actually how they looked. It's a photo um, from 1934. So these are the members of the Ohel Collective at the entrance to their hut. This is what they called it on Hayal Street in 1934. And most of them are newcomers to the land of Israel, mostly from uh, Russia. Um, so... Um, when Moshe Halevi writes about what he wants to do in the theater, he more or less says in so many words that he now is going to the Bible and he wants to construct an authentic identity. So he says, and I'm giving you a very, very kind of brief quote, indeed our primary intention at the Ohel over and above our social and ideological goals is to return to the origin, to the foundation, to the Tanakh, Hebrew Bible. And when we worked on Yaakov and Rachel, we uh, began our search for original Hebrew theater. And so, of course, all this, uh, you know, positivist um, um, talking and we'll <laughs> get to even more so in a moment. Um, but it, it's important um, to ground that, that they wanted to create an image of, you know, themselves, of a Hebrew um, Jewish theater um, in, in Israel. So this is... Um, uh, an interesting slide from uh, the tent uh, theater um, to the Bedouin tent, because what he decided uh, to do in order to learn how, um, how um, biblical identity looked like, quote unquote, was to take his entire group, you just saw the troop, on a tour from Tel Aviv to Be'er Sheva. If you know, Israel today takes uh, by train or by car about an hour and a half or, or two hours. You can imagine that in 1928, that was a bit more complex um, um, way to take. Um, and here, what I want you to look at for a moment is, first of all, the logo of the Ohel Tent Theater, from, uh, the, which was created in 1925. And this studio was the dramatic studio of the Culture Committee of the Workers' Union, Histadrut, of the Hebrew workers in the land of Israel, the tent. And I'll say something in a moment about uh, Ohel Moed, um, which is important in this context. But on the right, um, you see the actual Bedouin um, tents, the, um, which um, also in the Bible, but in, in, in um, contemporary language as well, definitely in that time, were called Kedar tents, or Ale Kedar, um, in the Negev or the desert. And um, you can find uh, in, in, in the book of Genesis, Kedar and Yatul, which were sons of Ishmael. So Ohalei uh, Kedar, or Kedar tents, became an, uh, a way to refer to the Bedouins, to, you already um, see where I'm heading to, um, the other in, in, in the context of creating this performance. And just a word about the name, um, and this also goes back to what we just said a moment ago, and I think this really ties in well, um, the name Ohel. Um, so Moshe Levi um, was a member of the Habima Theater. Um, Habima, um, which is the National Theater of Israel, um, the word bima was used by the Habima founders um, because of the bima in synagogue. Um, so the theater was thought to kind of replace, not in standoff, but in addition to or have the uh, congregational power of the synagogue, but in the theater to construct an identity and, and so forth. So in, when he le left Habima to found the Ohel, he chose the word oil because of the biblical phrase oil moed, um, which is mentioned in Exodus 39:32. Thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation of Popo finished. And the children of Israel did according to all uh, that the Lord commanded Moses, so did they. So um, it's
it's important it's interesting this um oil and and the sanctity of the of the the perception of the theater very very typical of the 1920s avant-garde which i um, just spoke about a moment ago but also this comparison between the oil moed the tent and the uh, uh, kedar tents the uh, oil kedar um and the, their idea um, or a decision which was a popular thing to go on a trip okay let's learn from the bedouins how how things looked in the Bible. So um, this what is what they did. And um, the guy who took them, maybe some of you have heard his name, Ze'ev Vilna'i. Um, this is a picture, a photograph of him from 1935. He led the tour. Um, he became a very, very prominent uh, geographer, historian um, of, of Israel. And um, he led many, many, many such tours. So this is uh, in Hebrew, this um, 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 call for people to join such a trip, but it says <coughs> a trip to Mitzpah, Bet El, Charavot, Ay Veshilo, led by Ze'ev Vilna'i. And the white circle here um, is translated on the bottom, each wanderer or hiker should bring two blankets, food for a day, and the Bible. So it's really getting to learn the land with the Bible, through the Bible, and um, they went and found all the places that appear that, that are in the Bible. So when he wanted to learn about Jacob and, and Rachel and the well and everything, he thought a good idea would be to go to um, the Bedouins. Um, it, the description of their encounter with the Bedouins is amazing. It's long. I chose the best um, portions for this talk today, just a few lines. And um, uh, so he says, Moshe Levi describes it in his diaries. The sky began to darken and we had no alternative but to spend the night at the encampment. The sheikh in, um, instructed that a sheep be slaughtered and that the banquet be arranged for us. We sat politely in a circle around a huge dish and helped ourselves with great festivity to grilled lamb seasoned in peppered rice, truly a feast for kings, while the sheikh himself supervised the meal and um, its uh, um, uh, contournments. So um, when we look at the um, photographs from the performance, we suddenly see that the scene and Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast looks quite probably like um, the, the, the feast that um, they experienced on their trip to the Bedouins, but um, it gets much more interesting than that, although this is already quite um, amazing. Um, and again, this is a very, very abridged version of a long but fascinating description of a performance the Bedouins put on for them as part of their hospitality. So after the meal, the Sheikh ordered the youngsters to put on a performance for us and two dancers, both of whom were made up and costumes in quite original style, entered the arena. One was black skinned and nimble, wore a woman's dress and had white flowers strewn on his face. So here we have white facing in order to um, do the cross gender thing. While the other had a sheep's tail tied to his chin, giving him the appearance of a satire and bringing to mind the Egyptian satires that adorn Greek, uh, ancient Greek vases. The rest of the group stood in a semicircle and broke into song, all the while urging the two uh, principals by rhythmical clapping. The two responded to these sounds by enacting a series of erotic rhythmic dancing movements, the like which I have never witnessed even on the best varieté stages in Europe and Asia. So first of all, we have an, a unique description of a Bedouin dance, which is um, um, quite uh, wonderful. But then he goes on, the man courted the woman with extraordinary artistry and she evaded his embracing arms with amazing uh, agility while displaying a marvelous range of erotically arousing dancing movements. At this point, the satire renewed his advances on his partner until eventually their bodies united in a single rhythmic movement, which was indeed reminiscent of classic oriental belly dancing, but was much more savage in nature and indeed quite original in conception. The singing and hand clapping of the Shabab grew stronger and stronger, of course, Shabab in, in the original, uh, until they too began, uh, uh, the two, they too began uh, performing uh, um, a dervish-like dance of ecstasy, which only added more passion to the rhythmic movements of the leading couple. So it's a very, um, um, of course, Orientalist, and I'm, I'm cutting, I, I'm not reading the lines where he tells we got very frightened and we took our women aside so they, they uh, aren't in danger, etc. cetera. Um, but eventually, and this is the main point, he writes that the visit to the Bedouins was extremely helpful to us conceptualizing the play. 
And it was no coincidence that we decided that Laban and uh, the, uh, the uh, Arami should resemble a Bedouin sheikh, patriarchal and cunning at the same time. And indeed, and I am not ashamed to admit this, the dance performed by Laban's family and his offspring at the wedding during the second act was copied by me almost entirely unchanged from the dance of the Shabab as they encircled the performing um, couple. And um, here, this is uh, uh, the scene of the dance, um, which I think is a very, very interesting and fascinating example of um, um, create, um, performing the self by actually embodying um, the other. So um, the entire performance, it has a, a very, very interesting history because they use music from different, um, from Yemenite synagogues in order to be um, um, more authentic, quote unquote. But, um, and you see that the constructivist um, stage takes from um, European avant-garde. So it's a real kind of um, um, amalgam um, amalgamation of styles. But I'm thinking, and this will be perhaps my central point throughout the other examples as well, about the, um, you saw the group of actors as uh, sitting in front, you know, the newcomers from Russia, how they create with, through their bodies within themselves this idea of the local Hebrew biblical identity by uh, playing the, the movements and um, which was a very powerful encounter probably of, um, uh, of the Bedouin dance they witness and took part in. And um, it's interesting um, to know this is a picture of the um, um, Ohel actors with some of the Bedouins. And um, this is how it appears in the book. So standing right to left, Daniel Ben Shlomo, Fogelson, a Bedoui. Mayor Margalit, a Bedoui. Zev Baraban, Yudit Barkait, David Arazi, a Bedoui. And sitting are Yosef Gold, Ben Zion Zilberg, and Yitzhak Shevo. So I thought um, I, I'd um, conclude this example um, with a very, very nice quote by Jacques Derrida in his um, Of Hospitality, or, uh, about, and he says that absolute hospitality requires that I open up my home and that I give not only the foreigner provided with a family name, um, with the social status of being a foreigner, etc., but to the absolute unknown anonymous other and that I give place to them, that I let them come, that I let them arrive and take place in the place I offer them without asking them either reciprocity, entering into a pact, or even their names. And um, it's nice because of this uh, um, image here with the names of the um, uh, oil members, but the um, gen generalizing uh, terms of the Bedouins. As, uh, whereas, of course, the Bedouins um, practiced um, 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 serious uh, mode of hospitality as um, is expected. But then again, if you think of it one step further, the theater performance um, did do this reciprocal thing by, um, uh, by uh, um, embodying and, and, and using and referring to this um, um, dance. And um, I think it's a very um, interesting example um, that tells a lot about the, the connection, tells a lot about the times that at, at that time about um, constructing identity. I will just briefly say also that one can imagine one can we be sure that the Bedouins didn't speak Hebrew or Russian, and one can be sure that the oil members didn't speak Arabic. So this Ze'ev Vilna'i, since he grew up in Haifa, um, at the time where uh, um, his, his teach, he, he knew Arabic, um, could mediate uh, between the two groups. So um, I'll also get back la later, uh, I'll mention later um, some questions about language, but um, this, I guess, um, yeah, would be my uh, first um, example here. Varaba Sharon. Um, so a lot of a lot of points of entry, and again, I think maybe I'll throw out a few things from what I'm hearing that we could continue some of these questions uh, in the Q and A. Um, um, one, just about the idea of uh, performance and performance art, and uh, an artist and audience engagement. The description you read about um, the Bedouins and how at some point the audience became involved. Um, this idea that we have of there's a stage and there's an audience and that they're completely, they're, there's no breaking the fourth wall is um, a kind of a weird, you know, modern invention that right in Shakespeare's time, people, you know, people would talk back to the stage. Um, and we see that there was this uh, flow of energy between the two things. So when we think about performance art and artist engagement today, 
and avant-garde theater, in a way, um, it's not that new. It's kind of going back to older ideas that each side kind of nourishes um, the other in some way. Um, so that's just one yeah. thought. The other just, and maybe we'll talk more a little bit later about language. It's just interesting to see the ways in which you're bringing to light uh, how in Hebrew, um, we talked about kahal and kahila, but also you talked about bima. I always wondered where, you know, the modern Hebrew word for stage, did that come from bima and shul? And it did. Um, and well, the, 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 the word in Hebrew is bama. Bama stage, which probably um, comes also from, but bima straightforwardly um, refers to habima, habima, this stage. Um, or uh, 100 refers to the um, synagogue bima. Yeah. Right, um, and then just a final thing, just as, um, as, as we think more broadly about the idea of like, what is a stage and what is a location for performance? Mm -hmm. The idea that, um, you know, not just the Bible as a kind of a location or a stage to play out um, the drama of a return to Israel and Zionism, uh, but the land of Israel literally as a stage I mean, they went out and just the idea of the, the little ad with, you know, join us with was food, water, and the Bible. Yeah. It's kind of hilarious yeah. in that way. And so, um, I don't know, there's just like, I, I'm appreciating the constant uh, enlarging of the stage of inquiry in a way mm -hmm. uh, and to take us outside the idea that theater and performance only happens with a stage and an audience um, and that there's not this kind of larger sense of possibility. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, probably, I mean, yeah, it, it, probably, and, and this, I'll say a word about this in, in my next example, but um, the interactions, let's say, between um, the OL members and the Bedouins during these three days, they were there, um, um, were at least as performative, so to speak, as, um, you know, the theater performance itself, which is already an aestheticized model um, of all these ideas. So, um, yeah, this is what I was saying also earlier. I think that theater um, studies opened up to the idea of performance studies at large that enables these thoughts about social, daily, um, and other uh, interactions and other, so and other kinds of um, um, comings to get, coming together. And I think that, um, you know, theater um, will definitely have to rethink its function these days because of the inability to do um, or to perform theater in conventional ways. So um, we all love going to the theater, but um, theater also as a medium, as a, um, as a social uh, construct, as, as, a, as an art, thinks about theatricality in life and about um, performative contexts more broadly, and I'm, I'm quite positive. I mean, these are things that have been, you know, written and thought of for, for decades, but I think now um, theater will, uh, Kunstwende, right? A, a turning point in arts uh, will have to kind of rethink what it does. Can theater be um, performed on a computer where people sit, you know, um, miles and miles away? Um, I'll just say that you probably ha um, um, all enjoyed that numerous theaters uh, around the world uh, made available their productions for people to see so people don't have to go to the theater they can suddenly sit and watch them on the screen pause them stop the live performance pause go get <laughs> and uh, you know rewind and start again i mean there's so many um so it's not that theater is becoming cinema but theater and its functions and its social functions is now kind of rethinking itself for sure yeah um, sharon uh, it's impossible to believe um but that we are already approaching 30 minutes of conversation um so uh, I want to uh, just, uh, I want to balance making sure that we get through things that you've thought about and prepared okay. and also have enough time for, for uh, the kind of the full salon conversation. Sure. So, um, yeah, I have, I have two more examples and I'll try to make them very, very brief. So, so, let's, so why don't we, let's try to do that. If that sounds okay with, uh, um, with all of our friends to maybe we can do uh, let's see. Um, yeah, why don't we do maybe r around 10 more minutes, sure. something like that, 10, 12 minutes. Um, that sounds good. And then we'll continue the conversations. Um, that sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Let's, let's Thank see you. what else, let's see what else we have. So I was, I mean, um, 
the um, question of, um, you know, touring or making tours um, reminded me, it's not, you'll see, it's more deeper, it's not a, a mere association. Uh, you might have heard of the Oberammergau uh, Passion Play in Germany. Um, this is a passion play that now has been running for about 400 years. It premiered in 1634 because of a plague. So what happened, there was a pandemic um, in, and a plague in the area and the citizens of this Bavarian Catholic um, um, village said, okay, in order to save themselves from the plague, they'll put on theater. They'll put on a, a passion play um, about the life and death of uh, Christ. And um, so they did, they were saved. It started in 1634 and um, in 1680, they moved it to kind of um, round years. And ever, ever, uh, since then, every 10 years it's been performed. Um, so you're seeing here also a sketch of the stage from 1860, and in the center, um, James Shapiro's Oberammergau, the traveling story of the world's most famous passion play. Um, and he, he names his book this way, it's from 2001, because um, this also became, it was of course a religious play, but also became a very, very anti-Semitic um, performance, uh, which um, I mean culminated um, with a very famous uh, visit in 1934 of uh, Hitler, Adolf Hitler himself, um, to the performance, and um, um, this is definitely one of its characteristics. And after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, and with the Anti-Defamation League, um, I mean, at first they they performed. Um, they continued to perform, but around the 1980s, it became clear, you know, that um, and the Anti-Defamation League wouldn't let them continue performing the play the way they had for um, um, centuries, although there are all, all kinds of um, changes that took place in the play. I won't go into that right now. Um, and you probably, it's, it is very famous and people from uh, across the world um, came to see it, um, not only from Europe, throughout the 20th century, et cetera. Um, since 1990, um, this uh, Christian Stuckel, whom you see on, on the right, um, in order to, by the way, to direct the play or to participate in it, you have to be from the village. So he's from the village, a very um, um, good uh, uh, director. And he, together with his dramaturg Otto Juber, they really took uh, on themselves a mission of, I, I, I'm, I'm careful with this word, but would use it of tikkun. And um, here there's a paradox because you have to tell, um, you know, the um, religious story as it is, it has its own history. There's the oath that they continue to perform every 10 years from 1634 till eternity. And of course there is history. So this convergence again of um, 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 religion, let's say in history is complex. And um, it is a very, very impressive performance. It's a, a huge building. It's an eight hour um, production. Um, it, it runs every once a decade, but for months and months and months, um, eight hours a day, the entire village participates. It, it's a very famous story. And if we have time in the conversation, I can elaborate on that. Um, as I told you, here's a small surprise. In 2010, I saw, we saw the uh, performance. Some of you remember um, uh, my, uh, our daughter, Leah. She was uh, at the time um, about eight years old and we were at the bed and breakfast here of Mr. and Mrs. Dashubel. So I'm connecting it to these, um, not, that's not the only tour I'm talking about, but we also uh, made the trip because I do a lot of work on um, passion plays. Um, and, uh, but um, what I want to show you is an image from the 2010 uh, um, production and um, it's been um, changing ever since. Um, so here you see the Last Supper with its own um, complexities. I mean, was the bread the matzah, challah? So the questions of interreligious, um, you know, Jewish Jesus, etc. is a complex question. Again, there's a lot to be said about it. But you see a very um, um, uh, respectful representation of uh, uh, Jewish um, identity in, in uh, Roman times. Um, you see, of course, the scroll, uh, the biblical scroll on stage. And um, uh, what I'm taking as a very, very brief example is the decision, although the entire majority of the audience is definitely not Hebrew speaking, um, but to perform the brachot in Hebrew. So um, this is a quote from the uh, Passion Spiele Opera Mergau from 2010. Um, Jesus, Baruch Atah, Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, etc., etc. 
uh, breaks the bread and gives it to them uh, and disappears uh, three or four times in, in the text. And there are other instances, even more complicated ones. I was shocked to discover a line from Hannah Senesh's poem, but I, I won't go into that um, right now. Um, what's interesting about this, apropos um, embodying the other, is also here the um, German actor is now performing this um, um, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew text. And um, these are a few images from um, uh, a documentary, the Bavarian Passion in the Holy Land. So what Christian Stucke did, one of the things he did is took the group of uh, the leading uh, 30, uh, the group of leading uh, 30 actors um, uh, of the play to visit the Holy Land. And of course, they go and visit um, the sites the, uh, that are um, holy to, to Christianity in Israel, in the land of Israel. But also this visit quite like, um, or, or you could compare the visit of the um, oil theater to the Bedouin tent. Here they are all in a moment entering uh, the Wailing Wall. And this is him, this is Christian Stuckel now um, standing here. And it also includes a visit to Yad Vashem. So um, it is, uh, he takes very, very seriously the question of performing um, this uh, passion play. I don't think, you know, he or anybody solves all the problems and history is complex, as we all know. But there is a very, very, uh, there's a lot of work on, on the uh, consci um, conscious um, and uh, uh, conscientious and, and, and um, understanding of the meaning of playing um, this interreligious uh, text. Um, the irony, and I said I'd do it very briefly, is that, um, you know, um, I was also supposed to see the, the play now in 2020, um, the play that started because of a pandemic in order to save themselves from it was now uh, postponed because of the <laughs> pandemic to uh, 2022. So, um, so this would be kind of uh, the second example. And I can quickly, if you want, move on and then we can maybe open up to discussion or if you wanna, or should I stop for a moment? Um, no, let's uh, let's keep going. Yeah, let's let's finish the material, and then, then we'll open up the larger question all at once. That's great. So my third example, you know, Broadway's closed, and um, that's very saddening as well. But um, I don't know. I got to see the band's visit there uh, by um, Itamar Moses, and it's based on a screenplay. Maybe some of you know by Iran Kolirin and uh, the music and uh, lyrics by David Yazbek, and it was directed by David Cormer at the Barrymore Theater in New York City in 2017, 2018. And of course it won, I don't know, numerous uh, Tony Awards and um, all, et cetera. And uh, it really is, you know, I have to say one of the um, beautiful and moving uh, musicals um, I saw and uh, was very uh, proud also to see um, um, the Israeli actor um, Sasson Gabay in the leading role there. So that was a, a lot of pride. But um, what's interesting about this example in the context of everything we're talking about, um, I was speaking about playing the other, looking like the other, costuming as the other. Here it's a question of accent, pronunciation, and language. So if you know the film um, or, or the, have seen the musical, which is, and it's terrific, um, the, the entire um, um, almost euphoric but definitely optimistic um, idea of mutual understanding is based on a misunderstanding. So the Egyptian band that arrives in Israel in 1966 is um, they are on their way to the town. Maybe you've heard of Petah Tikva, um, which uh, means in Hebrew, Petah Tikva means in Hebrew, literally opening of hope. It's one of the um, oldest um, towns in, in Israel, real town. But since um, usually or often um, Arabs um, do not pronounce uh, the P letter, instead they have it as a B. Um, he says when they arrive at the airport, we need to go to Beta Tikva. Instead of Petah Tikva, we need to get to Beta Tikva. So instead of opening of hope, they arrive at what would literally mean house of hope, which is, um, there's no such place in Israel, but it's depicted as a very, very rundown peripheral uh, city in uh, the south of um, Israel, um, where, oops, I'll, I'll move backwards to that, where um, uh, here, this is Sasson Gabay and Katrina Lenk. Um, so she opens up, apropos also hospitality, her cafe, 
to the Egyptian band and over the night of, um, you know, beautiful songs in the musical, but kind of minimalist discussion, uh, um, dialogues, they open up and reveal their most intimate stories to one another. But perhaps one of the most interesting choices in this musical, and I was quite stunned by it, was the entire convention, and of course on film it's easy, the entire convention of the, of the performance is that the Egyptians speak Arabic among themselves and the Israelis speak Hebrew among themselves and whenever they need to interact, they speak in English. So whenever they interact, they speak in English. On Broadway, uh, most of the audience speaks English and not Hebrew or Arabic, um, but they did not translate with supertitles or anything the lines in Arabic or in Hebrew. Um, I think this is a very, very bold decision, very interesting and wonderful. Of course, you can understand what's going on through the context. That's no problem. It's all solved. But um, audiences have this moment of not understanding, right? Um, we had this misunderstanding before the bet and the P, but not understanding and listening to the texture of language and um, this bewildering experience, I think it also puts into question, um, you know, the, la the English language as a mediator, um, uh, an international language. I think it's an interesting question if everybody moves to Zoom now, if, Zo if theater moves to Zoom now, and theater is global and international, so in what language does it take place? I mean, uh, how, how is it performed? And I, I think these are very, very interesting uh, questions. Um, this slide here um, shows you, uh, is a nice example of that, because if you look at the um, uh, background, here in Hebrew it says, Amerkaz l'tarbut aravit petach tikva. I don't speak Arabic, but I assume it says the same here um, um, on the bottom, but uh, such a center would never uh, translate itself to English, which would mean, of course, um, the center for Arabic culture in uh, petach tikva, but as you can see, it's not translated. I mean, so um, audience members, you know, can do their best to understand the Hebrew or the Arabic, and of course they understand what's going on, but um, this is an example of a convention that goes on uh, on stage. So I think it's a very nice uh, also example of, uh, of course it's central to the work itself, but of the interaction between um, self and other. And so it's, you know, the visit, the tour, and, and the visit to the theater, and um, <laughs> these would be my uh, three examples, so. Fantastic. Thank you so much.